Excuse us. No, pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Just move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. Okay, so, we got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. This shit better be good. Let's hope so. Shh. The movie's starting. I'm Mally Moore. I am Dustin Goes to Hollywood. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings, and I am so full, my belly hurts. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh i guess we're jumping I right ate into before the podcast this time usually i eat during the podcast but this time i ate before and my my stomach hurts did you have lobster perhaps nope that sounds delicious though nope mm. i just ate a bunch of pasta mm, okay lighthouse pasta <laughs> yes anyway uh, thank you for tuning in, everyone, to yet another episode of the Silver Linings Playlist. As Mally mentioned, we are a podcast that likes to watch movies like uh, the one we're covering today that don't end with a little bow on it, that uh, leave you wanting more, leave you in a sour state, uh, or maybe even your eyes gouge the fuck out like uh, in this movie. Uh, and what we like to do is at the end of those things, we like to come up with uh, a silver lining, a little glimmer of hope, something positive to take away from the ending of these movies. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't work out like that. This week uh, is a little difficult, if I have to guess. I'm 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 gonna straight up be honest right now. My silver lining is bullshit. Yeah, yeah, mine is too. It is 100% bullshit. But, but I think I make a good point. But uh, we have a guest joining us who may have. A silver lining that can top what we've got, which honestly wouldn't be too hard to do. Uh, this once uh, again proving that our guests are better <laughs> at this show than we are. Is this uh, this is a three peat now, right? If I'm doing the math right. Yeah, this is, this is the third time. This is the first time this gentleman has joined us not on a season finale. That's true. Uh, we were we are joined by returning guest uh, John Hoffler, aka Johnny Utah. Thank you for joining us on what is sure to be. Uh, quite, quite the episode. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be back. This was, uh, I, I'm the one that recommended this movie to Mally, because I was like, Mally's gonna dig this movie, but I literally can't think of anyone else who will dig this movie <laughs> that I could recommend it to. <laughs> Which is funny, because, like, the, like, of, like, the three people here in Atlanta that, I, or the two people in Atlanta I talked to, uh, you and our buddy Jason, uh, two of us really like this movie. The third guy <laughs> fucking hated this movie. <laughs> yeah, I went and saw it with Jason, and we walked out of the theater, and he was literally like, bro, what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> he was angry that this movie was made. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, we should have got him on this episode. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> well, I might be able to fill in for Jason, because I might be one of the three here then that doesn't too much care for this movie. Um, this is my... Well, you are a bit of a misogynist, so that makes sense. <laughs> well, I just... <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. this is just, it's just something with this movie where, uh, you know, it's like, I was telling... I've told a couple people, I was like, they're like, should I watch Lighthouse? And I'm like, I can't recommend it, really. Yeah. But also, I liked it. I'm not saying it's pleasant at all. Yeah. But, like, it, in retrospect, you know, the more I think about it, the more I like things about it, so there's those movies that people say you either love it or you hate it and this i can't think of a better example because this movie is so divisive i mean you either really like it or you just can't stand it and i this is my second time watching the movie of course we're talking about the lighthouse if the episode title didn't give it away um, <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i put off i i literally just finished rewatching it before we started recording but I put it off because the first time I was so excited to see it and I was just lack it was lacklustering to me. So I put off rewatching it and waited to the last possible minute. And yeah, it just it doesn't do it for me. And I know that I will say I watched I rewatched this movie as well as the film we are covering next week. Ooh. Back to back. Ooh. Not a and, pleasant uh, not a pleasant double feature. <laughs> Yeah, today's been fucking rough. Yeah. <laughs> That'll I, make more sense next week. Yes. Um, no, it's just, 
The Lighthouse is certainly A24's most ambitious movie, I would say. Um, just from the catalog that I know that they have. It's really a daring project. I mean, this was a very hyped up movie. It's essentially like A24's biggest art house movie that I can think of. And there was just so much hype behind That's this movie. That's such a funny sentence. I mean, it, it is. A24's yeah. biggest art house movie. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, this comes out the same year as Midsommar and Uncut Gems, like two other big A24 movies that are polar opposites. And then this one is snug right in the middle of those two. And boy, I mean, we'll get into it when we get into it. But let's um, let's talk about Utah. What was the first time you saw this movie? You said you saw it with a friend who didn't too much care for it. Is this the second time you've seen this movie? Uh, third? Maybe maybe fourth, technically. Third? Okay. I mean, um, because I will say, I the other day I was um, doing stuff on my computer. I had it on with subtitles, like, muted in the background. And then I actually watched watched it yesterday mm -hmm. again for the podcast. But because I knew I was going to be on here, I had it on kind of in the background. Um, so I saw it in the theater. And then when it came out on digital, I watched it again. And then, again, it played the other day in the background. And mm -hmm. then I watched it yesterday for the podcast. That's what kind of Utah – that's what kind of person Utah – that's what kind of Utah Utah is. That's what kind of person Utah is. This man just puts the lighthouse on as background yeah, noise. Yeah, it's not a casual viewing kind of movie. You really got to be in the mood for the lighthouse. Yeah, but then like – again, I used to fall asleep to Requiem for a Dream every night, so mm -hmm. I am not going to say that shit. That explains a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that does I, explain I owned, a lot. I didn't have cable and I owned two DVDs. Requiem for a Dream and Wedding Crashers. I was in a position like that. And I just my rotated two, them bad boys out. <laughs> I was in a position like that too, and my two movies were Talladega Nights and Blood Diamond. <laughs> so <laughs> Talladega Nights got a lot of replayability. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and the, the thing with the thing is, like, obviously, I'm a big cinema fan of cinematography and things of that nature. So to have it on over there, muted, where I'm just seeing like cool black and white semi orthochromatic imagery you know it's like yeah sometimes mm. you look over and someone's jerking off and you're like well that's not pleasant but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean this but, movie you know, looks it's... amazing oh yeah so so dustin what was, did you see this in theaters or did you catch I, it i missed it unfortunately um it was had a pretty limited run um but i yeah unfortunately i missed it but i did see this on digital right as it was released and like i said i was hyped for this movie because it was all anyone could talk about and yeah just i i mean maybe that was my problem seeing it for the first time at home on the couch i didn't really get to appreciate it as much i will say the movie looks amazing it's acted well it's directed well but it just the sum of the pieces of it together don't equal a fun time see, for me i didn't see this in theaters either the first time i ever watched this was at Utah's house on his couch when he wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not creepy at all. Yeah, I was going to say you snuck in to watch the lighthouse? <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> so I was like cat sitting for John mm -hmm. while he was out of town. And he texted me. He's like, hey, dude, lighthouse is out on digital. I bought it. Next time you're at my house, watch it. And I was like, cool. <laughs> Yeah. So I watched it and fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Glowing review from Mally Moore. Put that on the, on the box th art. That my review of this movie is fuck. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's funny because I literally I watched that movie. I watched it with Jason. We walked out. Jason was like, I hated it. Um, I was like, yeah, I don't hate it. It's it was you know disturbed me. It unsettled me. It was not pleasant. Um, but there were things in it that I like that like resonated with me or had me thinking about and i was thinking about it a lot like it, it kind of the cinematography the sound design everything kind of seeps into your bones and like unsettles you in a really weird way yeah you know, it's very immersive and it has atmosphere and it permeates i mean the witch is the same way it just permeates mm -hmm. you yeah. yeah you know yeah. that, See, that lighthouse sound alone oh dude Ugh. that like foghorn doesn't mm -hmm. 
quit. That is literally one of my notes. It, it's like my second note. That foghorn don't quit. <laughs> foghorn don't stop. Jesus. My Christ. first uh my first note literally when I'm wa- when I was watching the movie taking notes is literally in all caps that sound. Yeah. So yeah. I'm the same way. Yeah, See, it's... my my that's my second note. My first note is Pattinson, best mustache of the decade? Question yeah. mark. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll get into that because we're gonna get out of ourselves. Why don't we talk about the behind the scenes of the lighthouse first, and then we'll get into uh, the more if it's minutiae. the best mustache. Yeah, we'll we'll debate on that. <laughs> oh, I have a list. So, as we said, the year is last year, 2019. The director is Robert Eggers, who you might know from The Witch. Uh, the film stars Willem Dafoe, Robert Pattinson, and Valeria Karaman. Uh, the budget was $4 million. It managed to gross $18 million worldwide. Currently sitting at a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes and was nominated for Best Cinematography at the Academy Awards. Wait, what was the budget? Uh, $4 million. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Pretty, pretty modest budget. Interesting. Um, now... We should note, we're all technically still in quarantine. Yes. This is, and we've covered a few films that relate to that subject. This is by far the most quarantine film we've this is, covered. This is more quarantine than quarantine. Fuck. This is more quarantine <laughs> than quarantine. Also, this is a better movie. Quarantine uh, was bullshit. <laughs> um, why don't we, lastly, before we get into the film, why don't we check out the trailer? Uh, for those of you who may Ooh, not be too we'll familiar the with sound. this movie. Yes, and you can hear oh, the uh, infamous foghorn. <laughs> All right, here we go. I haven't seen this trailer in a long time. Tell me, what's a timber man want with being a wiki? Just <laughs> looking to earn a living. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. Foghorn for this movie is like the Brahms were for Inception. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, oh, it's just I mean, it's going to be synonymous with it now. Um, man, it's that's it's, definitely a trailer. It's a great trailer. I, <laughs> for me, it's I wish the movie was as clear as that trailer because one of the problems I have with Robert Eggers and it's purely a me problem. I don't. Fault him for Dustin, it. Dustin, all of your problems are you problems. That's fair enough. That's a good point. But what I was gonna say is I can't I can't do the period accurate dialogue. It's a chore to get through. I, it's the same problem I have with the witch, which I'd like the witch a lot more than this. Just because Yet you love killing of a sacred deer. Yeah. Well Which that movie has some of the most <laughs> just the weirdest dialogue oh of all God, fucking yeah. time. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, it's a me thing. I just, I can't do the, it's the insistence on having, like it even says one of the credits in the end of the movie is that he got the dialogue from old sea shanty journals and it's as period accurate as he can make it. And I'm like, that's fine, man. You can do that. But when four fifths of your movie are just two guys talking to one another and they're going mad and you're having to like piece together what the actual subtext of what's going on versus what they're actually saying to each other. It makes it difficult for me. And like I said, it's a me problem. I get it. 
I get why he does it. I love it. That's, yeah, I thought it was yeah, amazing. Funny. It's, that's I funny. want to talk like that all of the time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's so fucking blimey, <laughs> and coming from someone whose I'm favorite do the movie, whole episode like that. <laughs> Please don't. Come, coming from somebody whose favorite movie is about a person in isolation going mad. Like I, I don't know. I find this movie hard to to really grasp onto. Like none of the characters of the two really are likable, and I think my problem also is the runtime. I think this movie works so much better as a short that an almost two hour runtime of just two guys arguing in a lighthouse. It's I don't know. It's like I said. I'm just I'm not a fan of the movie. I I see get... this movie feels kind of short to me. Like I feel like we're in and out this bitch. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I mean I full disclosure. I fell asleep on this rewatch and woke up as he was as Robert Pattinson is beating tentacled version of Willem Dafoe, uh, which is a great scene. And this movie's got some great uh, visuals. The night uh, took you to be your mistress in the sea. I told you I'm gonna do that the entire fucking time. <laughs> You're gonna lose so oh, many listeners. So many listeners. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're we have like two at this point. <laughs> um. All right. Well, Most you guys, of them are past well, it's, guests. Well, it's interesting <laughs> because you know, like you keep saying, you know, like likable and like two guys going insane in a lighthouse, and like mm-hmm. I don't know. There's a lot to it that. I was reading into and inferring and it was, you know, the symbolism and the things that were occurring meant to me uh, Mm. in a way that I think there were things that resonated strongly with me that like, to me, it's not necessary. It's there's so much more than just two guys going crazy in a lighthouse. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably part of it as well. Well, we'll expand on that. Cause like I said, I, I can't grasp, grasp onto anything in this movie to really, dig too deep into it. I just, I can't find that latching on point. So is there anything in particular that stands out to you that's other than just two guys going insane? Well, it's really about power and shame and guilt and how toxic masculinity is a, like a, uh, a symptom of those things mm-hmm. because men mm-hmm. don't know how to deal with their, you know, I guess it's, it's part Freud sexual repression and dysfunction stuff, but it's also that Jungian collective unconsciousness, how it relates to your primal desires, you know, the shadow. Uh, Robert Pattinson is like running from guilt and he thinks he can have a fresh start. Um, mm-hmm. And he, you know, he's almost isolating himself and then, you know, getting out into these situ- getting out into that situation. And then he gets there and there's this power dynamic, you know, Willem Dafoe is like keeping the power from him keeping Mm -hmm. the light from him he wants the light he wants to be cleansed of his sins he wants to but he also he's also an entitled and obviously he's he didn't necessarily it doesn't seem like he 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 allowed a man to die he didn't necessarily murder the guy per se but you know he has all this guilt about that and it's like that first night when he gets there all he he it's like he goes to the island to escape his guilt and then it all literally the the log jam rushes up on him with the body like you can't yeah. run from it. And then Willem Dafoe is that guy that's like, this is all he has and this is his domain and his ego is wrapped up in it. And I think being somebody that, uh, especially when I was starting out uh, as a camera assistant, uh, got hazed a lot and got like worked for people that like really kind of, you know, they, they'll they give you jobs and shit things to do just to watch you just to either critique you on it like you do all this stuff but they'll find the one thing you didn't do or mm-hmm. they'll you know or th- yeah they like kind of lord over you and you want their approval like a father figure but you also almost would rather kill them you know it's like all yeah. those things are like i mean th- that's all kind of in here and then there's all these you know alleg- all- allegories to sexual repression and power and dynamics of death and sex and all those things and how that all gets like mixed up and like and and i don't know all that stuff like i was feeling and thinking the entire time i was watching the movie you know well i i got it down to um like an adolescent trying to get the approval of his father of like robert pattinson trying to 
well, not even trying to, like, doing what he thinks is a good enough job. And, I mean, most of the movie is Willem Dafoe berating him for, he's got to do his chores, he's got to do his duties, he's doing a terrible job. And it's just that childlike, you know, I want to please my elders, I want to get that approval, and he never does, um, coped with the isolationism, the sexual repression, like you talk about. I mean, there there well, is, and he like, doesn't. He he's like the thing is is that we're seeing the movie from Rod, Robert Pattinson's perspective, and right. it's an unreliable narrator. And um, we were see we see him working hard, but we also don't see all the stuff Willem Dafoe lists in the book, and some mm-hmm. of the stuff that he says. Because like there's there's one interpretation where I think the first time I watched it, I was like, God, Willem Dafoe was like gaslighting him a bunch and like yeah. manipulating him. But on this last watch, I don't think he was. At least in the way Willem Dafoe was playing it, because I was watching it, and it's like when he says some things, like the look of on Willem Dafoe's face of actual concern and actual like, oh Tommy, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, like you know, like that. I don't know if he was necessarily guess because I actually had a page that I was calling Dafoe insults, and <laughs> but and I but I, in all honesty, I ran out after four or five of them because he. He only insults him like at the beginning a little bit. He calls, you know, he says he calls him a dog. And most of the time when he does it, it's when he feels because obviously Willem Dafoe feels some sort of guilt about what happened to the previous wiki. Yeah, right. And anytime you bring that up, like when he slaps, when he slaps Pattinson, it's like it's because he brought up the previous person, you know, and his guilt manifests in this like power thing as well. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I guess that begs the question then uh, is Willem Dafoe really that attached to the light or is that just how robert pattinson is interpreting it like is willing yeah. to folk really that obsessed is. with keeping it from him I oh you do think is. he is okay because i think that's all he has he said he had a family he had everyone else and yeah. it wasn't for him and he ran away and he's like the, that's the only thing i think when you feel it's the only thing he has power over is that domain that's his domain he's like i'm the king of this fucking castle basically yeah and that's when yeah. he wraps his entire identity up in and like, you know, you can even believe, do you believe that all the stuff, because some of his like stories don't add up about his leg and things of yeah. that nature. Mm-hmm. And so like, you're like, is he bullshitting a lot of these stories about his old sailor stories where they stories other people told him like other lighthouse keeps. And then he's just trying to create this air of I'm this old sea dog that is the king of this castle. Like, you know, I own this giant phallic object that we're trapped in because I'm the man. Ooh. On that note. Question, is this the most phallic movie of all time? Yeah, Are you just saying that because the lighthouse is literally shaped like a dick? <laughs> yeah, and that was Dude, the intent. Like there, are, like, there are dicks all over this movie, and, you know, dick-shaped things. <laughs> and, no, yeah. I think, dude, I think it ties in. See, Utah sees where I'm going, kind of. Yeah, well, I see exactly It ties in what with the mean. whole toxic masculinity thing and everything. Two toxic like, there's a, male egos like, trapped in a dick. Exactly. Like, it literally, they, the entire movie is basically fucking one big dick swinging competition between the two. Yeah, that's, I, I can get down with that. It's a very phallic movie. I can get Second, down with that. Second, maybe only to shame. <laughs> See past episode shame as well. Um, no, I can get down with that idea of, of all the things you guys are mentioning. Um, I just, I, it's, it's just not, I, I feel bad because I don't want to spend this entire episode just saying, here's what I don't like about it. But, I, like I said, I think... All those pieces are there. I think it's written well, directed well, acted well, shot well. It's just for some reason, the whole thing doesn't click for me. Um, maybe with those newfound interpretations of it, maybe on a rewatch, which will be very far down the road for me, uh, maybe I can appreciate those things more. Yeah. One thing. You're just going to be watching it and be like, oh, man, there are dicks everywhere. The symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's um, a lot of symbolism and a lot of. I mean, he obviously put shit in there to confuse you and to make things not make sense on purpose. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. So yeah. There's... It's it's very Kubrickian in like trying to mislead you with, you know, things not adding up and things not making sense and making you feel that sense of isolationism and going mad i definitely feel for robert pattinson and willem dafoe in this movie like i feel for their loneliness because this movie only has really those two the mermaid actress and then like the extra help that they get when they first get on the island and that's it like that's there's nothing else going on uh so you have to 
you're with these characters the entire time and it's it's exhausting at least for me like i feel the wariness of this island yeah 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 and it's 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 there's there's kind of there's all these different allegories and and like uh correlations to different myths and things of that nature obviously it's like is that place purgatory uh there's a proteus and prometheus thing obviously the last image is Mm -hmm. is yeah directly (laughs) referencing prometheus yeah um but there's a proteus and prometheus thing there's you know the not the movie guys no (laughs) not the movie (laughs) it's it's really heavily referencing yeah (laughs) no one runs in a straight line away from a falling object it's fine yeah, um, the uh, um, the lighthouse is uh, was built by the engineers. So yeah, no, I believe Shit. that. I believe that. Um, so I will say, <laughs> the longer we're in quarantine, the more I start to resemble Willem Dafoe's character. I realize that on this mm-hmm. rewatch, because mm-hmm. my beard is getting out of control. He does pull off the old wayward sea shanty look oh, like really well. Hell yeah, so good. Um, the performances are just so, unbelievable. Yeah. No, they're really great. Um, uh, I want to talk about the comedy of this movie. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Pattinson killing the seagull. Hilarious. Is the most hilarious thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and honestly, I'm very shocked that has not become a meme. I know. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some, even on probably the uh, probably the A24 subreddit, there's some meme with that going around. There's a gif for sure. Like, there has to be. Because the moment <laughs> I saw that, I was like... I was like, oh, okay. So, like, the seagull is us. Robert Pattinson 2020. is the year 2020. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. True. I mean, I mean beating also, the do you guys think the seagull is the previous, you know how yeah. he says, it's the previous. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. 100%. Spirit, the spirit like of the, the previous one, like, second. Yeah, the one missing its eye. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. that makes it immediately apparent. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess then there is the, the the further question of, is that something that Robert Pattinson is actually seeing? Like, is it a one-eyed seagull or is it just a random seagull that he kills? Like, you mentioned he's an unreliable narrator. Maybe he's putting that yeah. guilt of the, of the past wiki onto himself. Maybe that's what this little rock has entailed for him, like just making him go mad. Kind of like uh, the hotel in The Shining talking to... Jack Torrance, maybe that's what's happening for Robert Pattinson here. Um, yeah, and I kind of almost took it as like the maybe not the seagull warning him or anything, but the yeah, but in a way there was like something about it because the the um it's like he he gets uh I don't know like you you he the, the, he's like you're you know the light is mine you see him up there uh Robert Pattinson has his guilt hallucination of the log jam rushing back and bringing the body back to him Mm -hmm. um you know uh and then like he then he's just doing the shit work you know just doing the shit work the light is mine he's doing the shit work shit work and then the goal shows up and it's kind of like that in that one it's almost like it's just kind of like hey man like i'm warning you like this guy's a fucking asshole basically i don't know you know yeah (laughs) yeah and i mean that's very true the next time the gull shows up is after Willem Dafoe slaps him and then he's laying in bed and the gull pecks at the window. Kind of like, see, told you. And walk, it like literally yeah. walks away. <laughs> and then the next time is when Dafoe drops him while he's painting the lighthouse. Yep. And he comes and pecks out of his leg. Too. Yeah, I never thought about it that way. I literally thought and it was. He can't beat Robert. He can't beat Willem Dafoe up because he wouldn't make, he wouldn't, you know, if he beat his, 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 you know, the wiki up like the older wiki he wouldn't get his money he wouldn't like he'd be mm-hmm. kicked out of the service yeah. he still thinks i'm getting off the island in a couple of weeks or a week it, or the next day at that point but yeah. his frustration is so built up that he beats the bird because he needs to exert his frustration and and exert his power and that's why he's also like you know again and that's when it gets all mixed up in the power dynamic and gets weird and there's Maybe I missed it, but there's the reveal that comes near the end of the movie where we uh, Winslow reveals that his name is also Thomas, which is Will yeah. Nafo's character's name, right? Is there something yeah. more to that that I missed, or is it just a happy coincidence that they're named the same? Because the it's way I took it, okay, That's why I was. I, I wonder it. if there's anything to the theory that they're both the same character, like a like Will Nafo is the older version of Robert Pattinson, who's had 
this experience of being on this lighthouse and so it's he's become like obsessed with it like that is his, that that's his only thing that he has going which is why he's so you know deterring of patents mm-hmm. and getting too close to the light and everything i mean is there yeah, something I, to that that Am one I doesn't too deep? register with me but you know i, I yeah. i've read it on reddit and other things oh and, really <laughs> yeah i've read that like people saying that and i was just like i mean i mm-hmm. personally don't buy it but i can see how that could be an interpretation I mean, there's everything's so kind of vague and ambiguous anyway. So I feel like it's one of those movies where you any theory you attach to it, you can prove and disprove equally as easily. Uh, I mean, we've done movies like this in the past before where there is no real definitive answer, I think. So, you know, take, I mean, I don't truly believe that. I'm just wondering if, I mean, naming your both your lead characters Thomas and then just happen to be a happy accident or a coincidence that you reveal at the end of the movie just feels like it's, it's, uh, you know, one of the breadcrumbs on the path to something, but I don't know exactly what. Eh. Yeah. I mean, maybe oh, he yeah. just thought it was funny. That conversation of I'm Thomas. And he's like, I'm yeah. Thomas. And he's like, yeah. no, I'm Thomas. I mean, if we want to talk about conversations, the trailer that the second trailer they put out for this movie, the what trailer, did you guys see this? Oh, the what? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. God damn, it's a brilliant trailer. I, I kind of wish that was the only trailer we got for this movie because it, it, what an insane, <laughs> <laughs> what an insane piece of work. But I love it. But I mean, when you watch that trailer, you kind of know what you're in for. <laughs> yeah, it's it's comedy. It's insanity. It's it's everything wrapped up into one piece. I mean, it's speaking a, of the comedy, amazing. it's like that that the whole like fight over the lop over whether he likes his cooking or not. Like because they oh, kind it's. Of, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a fifty stereotype of husband and wife. Like you don't like my cooking. <laughs> You're fond of me, lobster. Yeah, I've seen it, <laughs> dude. No, guys, they're they're just saying lobster. They're actually talking about their penises. <laughs> <laughs> You're fond of me, lobster. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Hear, hear me out. <laughs> but it's like during the day, uh, like Robert Pattinson almost takes on the wifely duties, and then at night. Willem Dafoe takes on kind of more of the wifely duties. They like yeah. switch. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's the only time that like they can actually kind of connect, you know, they can actually talk well, it's to like each other a little bit. They, they, they seem moderately fine during the day, but as night creeps around their their inhibitions just let it loose. And like they, when they start at drinking throats. Yeah. They're at mm-hmm. each other's throats. And then the next second they're hugging and dancing and then they're oh, screaming dude, at one the, another. Like, them like at night drinking is like my those are my favorite scenes because it's just like the way they edit them it's like they're dancing they're dancing they're screaming at each other yeah. they're dancing they're fighting they're embracing each other deeply then they're snuggling it's adorable it's it's uh <laughs> that montage when yeah when they're drinking and shouting and everything near the end is is it's it, like an old couple that have been together forever. Like that's why that scene is so funny to me. The fond, of, you're fond of me, lobster. It's, it's, it's good. I mean, we talk about the comedy, but is Again, there lobster is penis? <laughs> is there another Oscar nominated film that has a line just as amazing as "and you goddamn farts"? <laughs> when he's yelling about how that's a good point de- gross and decrepit Willem Dafoe is he's just screaming about his farts <laughs> yeah because just permeating you know like Willem Dafoe permeates his entire world literally the smells are offensive it, you know the, I mean the 19th it, century you're in a lighthouse I mean we see just the water they drink I can't imagine it smells pleasant in that lighthouse ugh Oh my god! Plus the, Ooh, the smell of the tide. Probably smells like shit. Yes, yeah, it, it smells probably like death. smells like farts, Dustin. It probably does. Even when he's not farting, it just smells like farts. Um, I have a a question for you too. Uh, how long on this? The answer is dicks. Well, funny you should say that. Uh, my question: How long is the dick? No, 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 no. But how long on this deserted island on in this lighthouse? Would it take until you decided to jerk off to a whittled version of a mermaid? Because <laughs> two point five well, seconds. Yeah, because Robert Pattinson like almost immediately is like, "Well, there's my porn right there." <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I mean, 
It's something he's going to have to do eventually. Might as well just get it out the way, you know? There's a lot of jerking off in this movie that I did not... I mean, I remember it being in the movie, but on this rewatch, I'm like, there's a lot of jizz all over this movie. Like, I mean... Yeah, every bodily just, fluid. Yeah. That can come <laughs> out of a man is again, in this movie. <laughs> in this lighthouse, it's covered in semen on both levels. <laughs> Boo. And, thank you. <laughs> and it smells like farts. Ugh. Well, uh, I'm proud of that. That was good. That was terrible. Um, again, very phallic movie. Okay. Well, are we gonna talk about the fucking mermaid? Yeah, we can definitely talk about the mermaid. That uh, thing is terrifying. I don't think I've ever seen, at least in a movie or anything, a mermaid that has basically a vagina. Like, yeah, it's just literally that modeled one... on a shark's. Yeah, that's what the production modeled it after. Like, like it's one quick shot Jesus. in that montage. Yeah, shark vaginas are scary. I'm not gonna. Yeah, lie. That, yep. Shark you vaginas. That's the, no thanks. Th- yeah. The uh, the official opinion of the Silver Linings playlist. Uh, say no to down, shark vaginas. <laughs> down on yeah, shark change. vaginas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I I fuck with Shark Week, but not like that. <laughs> I mean, is I guess that's another question: Is the mermaid real or not? Or not? Is it just a manifestation in Pattinson's mind? Like you can do that with every single element of this movie: Is is this real or not? Or is he? Yeah, just it was interesting on this last fourth, technically fourth watch, how much I was like, "Oh, he's just hallucinating because of urges and repression and things of yeah. that nature." Yeah, uh, like I don't mm-hmm. think she's real at all. No, you know? I don't either. I don't think, no. I mean, you can kind of couple that with when he's beating Defoe near the end and Defoe's turning into that giant octopus-like monster. And then we, mm-hmm. we cut to the wide shot and it's just them two on the ground wrestling. Like, it's definitely, well, or at least the way I take it, it's Pence and just losing his mind. Well, it's because, I mean, he 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 hits him, he falls, and then when he gets on top of him, he sees the mermaid. And she, like, yes. rubs her hands on his face, and then uh-huh. he, like, looks down, and that's when the, it's Willem Dafoe in the barnacles, and then it's, like, he, he goes, ah, and then he starts strangling him, and then, you know, like, yeah. so it's, again, it's that same, like, it's all tied into that, like, hallucination, and I don't know. Again, like, it was crazy to me, like, again, on this last watch, when I was, when I was actually taking notes of every scene, how mm. I suddenly realized that I thought, like, Willem Dafoe has a lot of guilt, and he has a weird power dynamic, and he, you know, he's abusive, and and gaslighting and things of that nature but like where i was like dude no winslow is fucking crazy though yeah (laughs) like yeah that dude is like he's (laughs) insane from the get-go yeah no and he was running from it these two were destined to to murder one another or at least (laughs) be at each other's throats for the duration of this day i mean yeah pat pattinson is is off the rocker immediately i mean the first thing he does when he gets there is pockets that mermaid doll like like any normal person would see that movie, oh that's cool i'm mean, you know keith has hey, a look i found a mermaid he, like, he was like but i'm gonna fuck yeah. this thing later well he like he keeps it like he just found a diamond like <laughs> that's that's basically his porn it's like oh i found this under the mattress and it, even further it's within the mattress <laughs> it's some special well, but, kind and of that, porn. that that gives you a little thing it's that he's secretive and he's covetous and he's yeah in his first like he doesn't want to share like sex you know yeah yeah i mean he doesn't ever tell defoe that he sees a mermaid like he saw a mermaid right no he pulls the Mm -hmm. he blames him later for planting it he like holds it up and is Mm. like he's like you know you had this and like and he's like but now i'm free of it and your your machinations or whatever you know oh yeah no i mean he doesn't tell him about the actual mermaid that he quote unquote sees either right oh yeah about any of that yeah Speaking of that, um, my the one thing in this movie that I really do like is the visuals. Like, not even just the film stock that they chose to use for this movie and like the cinematography, but just the straight up blocking and the the visuals of everything. Like, what Willem Dafoe as the tentacle monster is horrific and looks yeah. so good on super like, badass. It looks so good. And my favorite shot of the movie is that almost medieval Renaissance era looking 
almost like a painting. Of the light yes. coming out of his eyes. Yes. Yeah. I think that's I think that's everyone's favorite shot in this I mean, movie. <laughs> it is so striking. It makes me think of um did you guys see the house that Jack built? The the Lars von uh, Trier. There's that shot of uh well, spoilers briefly, not really. Uh, there's just a shot of uh um what's his name matthew uh fuck what's the league is it matthew dylan who stars in that movie anyways it's him in a boat uh that is equally just as striking and i feel like a lot of these uh directors nowadays are taking very specific era paintings and and sculptures and putting them into these modern day art house movies and it really pays off well like that shot is it's framed so perfectly. I mean, and coupled later on with the final shot of the movie of Pattinson being gouged to death is mm-hmm. it's beautifully macabre. It's so amazing. Like yeah, that is one I mean, thing they nail in this movie is the visuals. Oh yeah. And it's like, it's interesting because he spills his being, you know, so like they, they, f- they, they have their night of craziness and everything. They're like, yeah. They're yelling at each other, then they dance, and then they almost kiss, and instead he pushes him away. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then but no, they do. They like he literally almost goes for a kiss, it, then he pushes him away, and then true. he pulls his fight he pulls his fists up like, Well, like, I'm repressed. I'm obviously not going to have sex with you, but like and then they start fighting each other. They start and they're both like, Yeah, and they just start beating the shit out of each other. And yeah. then yeah. It, they're it cuddling afterwards full. like they just fucked. Yeah. Yep. It almost goes full broke back. I was just about to say this is the anti broke back mountain. <laughs> well, oh. yeah, and like, and so, and then he's like, he's like, I'm Thomas, and like, I want to tell you about the thing, and he goes, don't be, don't spill your beans to me. I don't yep. want any part of your guilt, basically, like saying, like, mm-hmm. I have enough of my guilt. I don't need any of your shit on me right now. And yep. then he tells him anyway, and then that's when. You know, when when it's doing the why just spill your beans and like slowly panning through the lighthouse and then Robert Pattinson, I still I think they're still just laying there on the floor pa- passing out because yeah. that's like echoing in his head and he's hallucinating. And then the, you know, reference to that painting, you know, Sasha Snyder's Hypnos, like mm-hmm. is like now Defoe sees him for who he is. So like he yeah. sees the body, he turns it over. The body is him because he stole the man's identity. And then who grabs him and shines his light on him? It's like Willem Dafoe sees you raw in all of your horribleness or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just super effective. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the visuals of this movie are definitely the one thing I'm going to take away from it. And like, that one nineteen one aspect ratio, yeah, you know? almost oh. a perfect square. Like you don't really see. I mean, most things, if you do see them in that square, it's a four by three, but yeah, this is like, and I, I think I read somewhere about the film stock that they chose specifically is from like the 1910s or something like that. And like, no, the so there's no, there's no film stock obviously around since then. So it's, it's actually Kodak double X, uh, right. 5222 black and white stock, um, which is like a 200 ISO black and white film stock that, they make that references kind of like what it has. Like they were saying that they like the contrast in it versus other things. Yeah. And then, and then there was a specialized filter that they put in front of the lens to replicate orthochromatic film. Right. Uh, and really, yeah. So, you know, like original old film originally only let in ultraviolet light and blue light. And then uh-huh. in the 19 or 1870s, 80s and stuff is when they finally there was a green channel kind of was added. It was able to sit, but it did not pick up red light. So if you look at all those old photographs, you know, people look really tan. They look really weathered and everything because any yeah. red in and their skin, skin pigment and everything through, yeah. comes out of black. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's interesting you said that they picked it for contrast because this movie doesn't have really deep blacks or really white whites other than the light from the lighthouse, at least for me. Everything has a very muted gray tone. It's hard to separate the theoretical colors that are there for me, or at least that's how I see it. I don't see a lot of deep blacks in this movie. Everything no, and is- I think it's because of the lenses, because what you were yeah. referencing about the 1900s is they they use baltar lenses not the super baltars which a lot of people are breaking out now i think atlanta shoots on super baltars stuff like that mm. but like the uncoded 1930s baltars right. um and then they had those pets fall lenses they had three pets fall lenses that were like they're the old lenses that kind of swirl the background and have like interesting fall off and they had a 50 millimeter path a lens from 1905 
and Holy yeah. shit. they're uncoated. So the light, you know, if they flared interesting or the light that kind of washed light kind of bounces around in the lens and softens the contrast. So there's like, there's contrast to the film stock, but then these lenses, uh, soften the contrast, yeah. you know, and create that. And if you'll notice, I, I, it might, I, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's the pets fall lens, but it seems to me that like, there's some shots of that, that it almost has like a blue gray tone to it. Some of the yeah. like, and I was like, yeah. I remember like watching them on my TV again, having it playing in the background and being like, well, this, this one's very black and white. And this one almost has like a blue gray to it. And I think it's the lenses, you know, it's the, huh. just something really interesting that they, you know, did there, but they had that filter and the, the film stock was 200 ISO with the filter in, it was 50 ISO. So it's Jeez. like, there's what no, the fuck? you know how much light they need? Like apparently the yeah. bulb of that lantern was like so bright that like crew members were wearing sunglasses, like the one that's sitting next yeah. to him by the bed. Holy shit. I was reading that like the lighting was so intense on the set that like Defoe and Patterson, uh, Pattinson really couldn't even see each other, that they were just blinded pretty much the entire time. Yeah, uh, yeah, Jesus. because you needed, and I guess outside they got a little bit more stop. Because yeah. basically, if, for anybody that doesn't know, it's like a modern cinema camera, you know, can it's like 800 thousands. is the sensitivity to well, thousands, yeah. 1250, yeah. <laughs> 2500, you know, it's like sensitivity. And it's like, mm -hmm. like 80 ISO is like nothing, nothing. You need bright <laughs> lights. And, and that's what they needed back in the day. You know, they needed like super bright lights. That's why everybody's like sweating and <laughs> old movies. Yeah. I can't <laughs> like, remember. I think no. it's Better Call Saul that Vince Gilligan was talking about the camera that they are using uh, can get up to like 8,000 ISO. So they, like they, they have what? such, yeah, it was something crazy oh. like that. It's obviously digital, but Oh man. Yeah. 50 um, ISO is now, nothing. Utah, because you know, you're, you're out on set on location, all that shit. How miserable do you think this movie was? Oh in my God. Brutal. Pure <laughs> brutal. misery. I mean, like, misery. I cannot fucking imagine how awful some of this was because you know that rain and wind was not fake oh yeah they like, went to cover set know. when it was nice they literally went to the interior stage when it was nice out because they needed the weather and, jesus yeah. yeah i mean they were like, in like they were in like nova scotia on an eye literal like on an yeah. outcropping and they built <laughs> they, that lighthouse for real took that four million dollars and really put it to work and let mother nature do the rest of it like this movie feels cold and wet and just awful. It just, it just really has a awful. vibe, you know. It yeah. just has that like yeah. super strong permeates like, your. Bones. I was I was rewatching this movie um, in my apartment this morning. I closed all the blinds and lit a candle because I was like, I'm gonna go period <laughs> accurate on this bitch. Uh -huh. <laughs> but like literally, like, I was sitting in the comfort. Like I was wearing sweatpants on a comfy couch, eating some cookies. Like I was comfy watching this movie. I felt miserable. Yeah. Just like just because of how like miserable they looked. Mm -hmm. Like just watching it, I was like, I feel so bad right now. Yeah. I but mean That's it, what the cookies were for. Yeah. I mean it's <laughs> it's a it is a, a movie that just it really shines for Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe. Like they give amazing yeah. performances. Uh, you know, Robert Pattinson going from like, you know, we've talked about this when we did the movie Remember Me, but him going from those Twilight movies <laughs> to really taking anything different that he can get and then going from like, you know, he even did Harry Potter movie. He did uh, Good Time, which is a phenomenal movie if you haven't seen it. Yeah. And then uh, High Life, I tried watching. I, I need to really, I wasn't really in the mindset for it, so I need to give it another shot, but it was yeah, really. I didn't, I didn't love it. It was intense yeah, it was for fun. the first half that I saw, so maybe I need to finish it up. But him picking and choosing these real, like, you can't f pick his career. You can't tell what path he's going down. And then, of course, the Batman and Tenet, you know, two huge tentpole movies that he can do, that he's doing. Like, he's, his career is just exhuming longevity. And the same with Willem Dafoe. I mean, we talked about his, uh, his film, My Hindu Friend, a while back, but. His career is kind of the same thing. Like, they are really underappreciated actors, I feel like. I mean, I know they get a lot of recognition. They're popular names, but they kind of get pushed to the side for some of the bigger 
more A-list, well-known actors, I feel like, at least when it comes around award seasons and stuff like that. But, I mean, it's something I'm sure Willem Dafoe didn't think twice about. But when he's being buried alive um, by Pattinson and he's giving that speech and just all the dirt and mud that's just Uh, flailing into his mouth and his teeth and his eyes. just Actually, I want to talk about when he gets buried alive. Mm Mm-hmm. More accurately, right after he gets buried alive, he gets out of that very quickly. Oh, he's he's sprinting with that axe. He's like <laughs> up, like he like it's like all right, I buried him alive. Robert Pattinson goes inside and then turns a corner, and then there's fucking Willem Dafoe with an axe. Well, we, like they've established he got that out of that. They've so established that quickly. Time to time to Robert Pattinson is not real like we're not seeing accurate time at all good point yeah like ever good point yeah i mean i like that he'll say things like he'll be like you know when they talk about rationing he's like you keep saying rationing." he's like i've been asking you to ration for three weeks and he's like it it, Mm -hmm. to them it's been a day to robert pattinson he's like what and he's like i've been asking you for three weeks to ration and you won't do it you keep giving me the same bitching and you're like wait what yeah um but but it's like it's interesting because he's like he starts burying him and then he, it looks like he's like feels guilty and wants to save him and then he like jumps in the hole and he just like, oh, wants he gonna keys. save him he just wants the keys <laughs> but he never like reburies him no he like runs I mean, off yeah. and leaves it you know he, so it's not like willem dafoe had to dig himself out of more than like a couple inches of dirt you know? yeah i mean he's true he, Fair point. he quote unquote dies before uh panton even finishes putting all the dirt on him anyway so um you know, I read, too, that Pattinson's first day on set was one of the masturbation scenes in the the shack. And that, like, how crazy it was for him to go from, you know, movies like Good Time and stuff like that to he's in this wet, damp shack jerking off in front of this crew in basically Nova <laughs> Scotia. Like, it was just such a such He a probably weird... fucking loved it. Robert Pattinson's kind of a fucking weirdo. Kind of a weirdo. But, I, you know. I, I I'm a huge fan of his, so <sighs> Oh yeah. I'm 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 psyched for his uh, again, the Batman tenant. I think he's eh, yeah. well he did his the right thing. Insane. He did the right thing that um, a lot of people, you know, it's like he he was like, Okay, I hate this whole Hollywood like thing that I'm in with all these fan these you know, getting like mobbed all the time and I have no privacy mm-hmm. and I have no anything. And, and if you hear stories about him, there's like stories that like he was getting like kind of stalked by some like f- Twilight fangirl, so he oh, just God, agreed. Yeah. And he agreed yeah. to meet I'm her, sure. and he agreed to meet her and have coffee, and he just bored the shit out of her. Like, yeah, on I, purpose. I read that. <laughs> he told her, <laughs> like, "You're just like." He, I think I read the same story that was like he only talked about himself and didn't let her talk, just so she would think he was a bad person and annoying and everything. <laughs> just like purging that whole thing, and then like I mean, it wasn't like the first thing he did after that. Didn't he go work for like Cronenberg or something? Didn't he do like Cosmopolis? Yeah, that, uh, and, like, Cosmopolis. Oh, I didn't the, see that, but I wanted to. Yeah, but it's. I think it's you, a movie. I think you mentioned it to uh, <laughs> to me too, uh, Mally, on like one of the. I think I did. First I think episodes I've talked we did. about it. I think I've talked about it on this show before, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a movie for fucking sure. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, he's just one of those guys that's like, he was like, okay, I'm going to go work with, you know, weird auteur filmmakers and just yeah. like do my craft and like, you know, learn. And I think there was a thing when they were talking about, why'd you do, take the Batman? He's like, well, I've spent the last couple of years making like movies that appeal to like two people. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that he'll you know, do like a string of indie movies that really alienate and isolate his fans. And then he'll do something like Tenet or the Batman and then go right back into doing these, these lower budget quirky films. Like I hope he continues that with his career that he'll pop up. And now, you know, here and then with like these big, big uh, tentpole movies and then just go right back into like the weird. Cause like good time was the first movie that I really appreciated him as an actor like i had appreciated him in you know like uh, harry potter and things like that but really see him take a new shine in good time was was intense and he you know i think he even lived with junkies on the streets of new york for like two weeks like homeless junkies just to really get into that vibe and like i remember reading that and thinking maybe, maybe that's gimmicky but man he pulls it off Dude, and some interesting apparently he has never used his real accent in a movie. Like even like, I think it was an interview with him about Tenet. Mm. Like even though he plays a British dude. Oh yeah. 
doesn't doesn't use his real accent. Like he refuses to use his natural voice. Like he changes it some way. For the, no he, well, what. he's he's he seems to be somebody who's doing like he's like, well, my character speaks this way. I'm not just doing yeah. playing me. I'm actually right. a character. I mean, yeah. Christian Bell kind of does the same thing too. Like I don't think you've really ever heard his Welsh accent in him. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't in interviews and things like that. But I can't think of a movie. That he's let his uh, natural accent go well. He, I mean, the maybe prestige he has. is close. Yeah, yeah. To how he actually talks. I remember fun, the prestige was when I realized that Christian Bale was British. Yeah, <laughs> I had no fucking clue Christian Bale was British until I was watching the prestige for the first time, and I was like, "Damn, he does a really good British accent." <laughs> but he was like, "Yeah, dude, he's British." And I was like, "Fucking what? <laughs> Batman's British?" Yeah, because he didn't. He didn't do. He did press for Batman Begins in an American accent because he didn't want people to think that Bruce Wayne was British. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It blew my fucking mind. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else we wanted to cover before we get into some of the other uh, segments of the show? Is there anything we missed? Uh, I mean, we I think we, we missed a, I mean, a lot, kind of, but also... We, 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 we could be here for a we while. We could be here for a long time talking about the subtext and all the little things of all the True. different scenes. I mean, I have eight pages of God notes damn it <laughs> i took six notes <laughs> yeah um the, 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 the guest on the show my, god damn they I, do so much better i don't have do. eight pages but i got a cup i have like three or four one page is just in big block letters toxic masculinity is deadly mm-hmm. yeah um oh also i'm pitching a new segment for the show where we come up with an alternate title Okay. For the film, and I'm going to go ahead and throw out my alternate title for The Lighthouse, A Couple of Dicks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it works on two levels. One, there's dicks all over this yep, movie. Two, yep. they're both assholes. Okay. Boom. All right. Three, there's homoerotic things. I think, I, think, I, think I nailed it. I don't think that's a segment that's going to stick. So why don't we move on to one that does. I'm um, going to bring it up every episode. <laughs> Uh, this is, if you're new to the show, uh, or a returning listener, this is a, a segment of show we introduced this season. This is called Prop Cop. So Utah, you're, uh, this is the first time you're being with us for this segment. This is, uh, where we pick one prop from the movie that we would like to own ourselves, a prop that really sticks out to us. Uh, and prop and we've already established costume set dressing that all counts yeah i was about to say prop has i been always a get yelled term. at for picking costumes but then this <laughs> asshole picks like a pizza set deck and <laughs> yeah. it's like it's a prop i'm like mm, is it prop prop is a relative term anything from the it's movie a, it's an umbrella term yeah anything you'd like to personally own just for your like your own collection so mally why don't you go first what's a what's a prop you want from the lighthouse well i was debating the axe yeah. But I think I'm going to go with the dead seagull. Just the dead seagull <laughs> puppet? <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. You, it's shocking how much use I would get out of that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I got to go with the what? obvious. I'm going to go with the mermaid doll. I mean, it's... Yeah. It, oh, That's gross. what I was going to... You know, I was like, I'd probably... The little mermaid, you know, just have a show. <laughs> someone be like, is that... Yeah, yeah. Exa- oh, I thought you meant the actual mermaid. Oh, yeah, the woman. I want that actress. <laughs> yeah, that's, okay, that's less yeah. okay, less weird. Ta- speaking less of toxic weird. masculinity, yeah. Dustin and I agree that he should take the model that played the mermaid. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, I just think that okay, little that whew, I was real concerned for a second there. The little Jesus mermaid, Christ. the little like carved mermaid. Wooden doll, yeah. I think bad. Uh, got yeah. it. Okay. I mean, Ooh, thank God. The axe is okay. cool, I'd but want it's Willem not Willem Dafoe in my house. Yeah. <laughs> the axe is hey, cool, but I it's just If I could take Pattinson's mustache, I would. <laughs> True. The the axe is cool, but it's not like an iconic movie axe at this point. It's yeah, not like it's the axe of the shining. Yeah. Which is why I didn't pick it. But uh you I didn't mean to take yours, but is there another item? Maybe you do want the axe <laughs> from the movie. <laughs> I mean that I mean that's I, I feel like when you said those words, the only thing that popped in my head was the was the, the mermaid, little right? mermaid. Yeah. The little mermaid yeah. thing. I was like, that's the only like iconic prop that isn't like just something they're wearing or yeah so really like regular. not throwing credit to that dead seagull puppet but whatever <laughs> i mean if we want to expand the definition of the word prop you could just take 
the light in the lighthouse, the light, the oh, giant actually, bulb. <laughs> no, one of my things was before I decided on Dead Seagull, I was going to go with just the entire Fresno light. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, like um, literally, I do not have the space for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're talking about like you. That would be you claiming the power for yourself. You'd be like, you yeah, know, Willem Dafoe. You took the light. You, that's the thing. Just, you took the just yeah, in I'm my living room. I'm establishing dominance on this podcast. <laughs> just in my living room, I have that giant egg shaped light just just constantly on. <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. oh yeah, you just have it, and then you you literally like. You, then you just play the snap all day long. You know that yeah. I've got the power. You just yeah. play that all day long and look at it and just have it just spinning. Just a rave in, in my house at all times. While furiously masturbating. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, that's a given, though, right? Yeah. Well, that's true. I It was implied. I didn't need to say it. Speaking yeah. of masturbating, why don't we get into silver linings? <laughs> How'd you like that segue? What? That, um, that's... I don't I would say that the silver li- you know your silver lining is that he did that he that he at least he got off a couple times but the last time he didn't and he was real mad about it. I don't, I don't yeah. like that segue. <laughs> um this is tough. Uh, this is real tough. Uh, again, I have one. Then you should probably it's go. It's kind of gross. Cool. I mean, it hasn't stopped right, us before. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and go. While y'all just think. Okay. Um. Dude got to fuck a mermaid. Like, how many people can say that? <laughs> and live to tell the tale. Or at least well, live. about that? <laughs> live for a brief period afterwards. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah, man. If anything I've learned from Harry Potter, mermaids are fucking deadly. Yeah. And Cabin in the Woods. Yeah. And probably so, you know, of other movies too. Yeah, I mean, uh, my notes literally from my silver lining just say, fuck, I don't know, dot, 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 that seagull got his revenge, question mark. Like, that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> I don't know, man. This is tough because Will and Defoe dead, Pattinson horrifically dead or dying. Uh, I don't I Or mean, maybe that's never it. dying and eternally. Yeah, perpetually. Suffering. Yeah. I got another one. Okay. Mm-hmm. The seagulls got to eat. Seagulls got to eat. They probably Boom. haven't had a I'm, good meal in a while, so yeah. I will say, as far as silver linings, I'm carrying this episode. <laughs> this is uh, one of our patented bronze lining episodes, for sure. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really... Uh, it's, yeah, I don't even know if I'd go bronze, dude. They're, it's like tarnished. It's, just, it's whatever that it's knife rust. was made out of that he had. You know that rusty yeah. knife oh, he was gonna stab true. him with. It's like that's the lining that you can find in this movie. I mean, oh shit, changing my prop cop. I want that rusty knife. <laughs> well, you know what? That's government property, and we're gonna have to dock your pay. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Every yes, I've time. seen the movie enough times that I can quote. <laughs> yeah, government yes. property that is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess, dude. Those, okay, cotton. can I just mention again that that freaking Triton speech when he insults him about the thing about his lobster and he great. just goes off in like, yeah. and literally, like, I was like listening to it and I'm like, so what he's basically saying is the 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 water will fill you until you're so bloated, and then Tri- uh, Triton will rise up and throw his you know spear at you, which bursts mm-hmm. you into so much liquid that you become the ocean. And which let's remember in context, spear. His penis. Yeah. Well, a trident. I mean, Excellent. three penises, I guess. Oh. Even better. <laughs> that's more power. Um, oh, that's a good point. My, I mean, if, if I had to say, I guess, silver lining in a way is when um, Thomas Howard slash Ephraim Winslow slash Young, <laughs> whatever you yeah. want to call him, uh, reaches the top of the light and he touches it. It opens for him and he touches it. There's a mix of like pain and ecstasy to it. Yeah. Yeah. And so he did get to touch the light and maybe he got what he wanted and felt purified in that moment. But the problem being that last shot is that is he going to suffer forever because of it? That's not very plain. But at least I guess at least he got to touch the light. He he was able to acquire the power that he wanted and that he wanted to have and that he thought would cleanse him and maybe it 
did, but then it cleansed him in that moment. But then because he stole the fire from the gods, like Prometheus, he has to suffer. Yeah, the parallels to Prometheus are so blatant. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's hard for Silver Lining for this movie. I think what we came up with collectively could surmise to one decent lining, I would say. So, mission accomplished. I I, I nailed two of them. So. <laughs> um, All right, be, before we move on, mm-hmm. I mentioned I have a list of what I consider some of the best mustaches in cinema history. Ooh. Are we counting and down, or is it just... Just any order? It's it's it, no, no specific order. I just made a small list of some of the most glorious mustaches, which I'm gonna th- I'm gonna say I think Pattinson should join this list. Okay. So <clears throat> here is my list of glorious mustaches in cinematic history. Mm-hmm. Groucho Marx. Okay. Mm-hmm. Come on. Yeah. Cheech Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel Day Lewis, Gangs of New York. Yeah. Epic. Charlie Charlie Chaplin. You know, classic. Can I? Uh, um. Yes. I just want to interrupt. Uh, Pattinson's period accurate accent also very similar to the Gangs of New York Daniel Day Lewis period Ooh, accent yeah. from the very same true. from the same region very from the New true. England. Yeah. He's they sounded very similar in terms yeah. of like. Right. Anyway, continue. Right. Great mustaches. Um, Great mustaches. The entire cast of the movie Tombstone. Mm-hmm. Burt Reynolds. Yeah. In general. Tom Selleck. You know Magnum PI. Come uh, on now. Um, oh, there's a heavy hitter. Wilford Brimley. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sam Elliott. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, here's another heavy in hitter. Tombstone. Net. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just Sam Elliott in general, baby. Come on now. <laughs> um, now this is another heavy hitter. Ned Flanders. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh um, I, like it. I like it. Keep going. Dennis Hopper, Easy Rider. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the entire cast of Super Troopers. <laughs> uh-huh. Billy D. Williams. Yeah. Richard Pryor. Yeah. Robert Redford, mm-hmm. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Richard Roundtree, you know, Shaft, baby, come on now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, special mention, because technically, TV show, but Nick Offerman, Parks and Rec. Glorious mustache. All great. All. And I'm going to put Pattinson up there with that list. Yeah. Glorious it's mustache. It's a great in mustache. Film. Glorious. <sighs> um, all right. So, pick me up movie alternatives. So, if you're new to the show, this is where we recommend a movie that you can watch after you watch The Lighthouse as a double feature, something that's totally different, or maybe something that's got a tie-in that will pick you back up, put you in a better mood, because The Lighthouse is a devastatingly uh, depressing movie <laughs> to end to end your night on. So, you want something else to to pick you back up. So, uh, I'll go ahead and go. First, um, the movie I think you should watch after you watch The Lighthouse. If you want a little more Willem Dafoe, why don't you watch Fantastic Mr. Fox? Totally different Ooh. kind of movie. but uh, Very, Yeah, not the same kind of movie at all. No. In <laughs> fact, uh, I, I think I've said on this show before, but I am not a huge fan of Wes Anderson, but I do like Fantastic Mr. Fox a lot. So interesting. Uh, that would be an interesting double feature. But again, you got that Willem Dafoe tie in there so why not so Mally, what do you got well now see i wanted to keep it kind of in the same wheelhouse so i'm going with another film that is just a great uh real real study of toxic masculinity and that film is talladega nights the ballad of ricky bobby oh <laughs> bring it back nice <laughs> all right i like it man that movie i've seen it more times than i can count Oh, <sighs> easily. No. I mean, what about you, Utah? Do you have an idea for a movie people could do as a double feature? Man. Uh, I, know, I might be putting you on the spot there, but. You know what? You know what I'm going to go with? Because I'm going to go mm. with two people uh, arguing and came out last year was I'll just, let's, you should do, uh, it's not going to make you feel better, but uh, you should do Marriage Story. Ooh, oh, okay. Fuck. Two people <laughs> in a power dynamic oh. about a relationship. Oh, but it <laughs> is. Oh, man. It's, I actually watched that movie with Utah the first time we ever saw it. Right. <laughs> Just me and Utah sitting in the dark in his living room. <laughs> this kind of relationship we have. Yeah. Yeah. It's cute. I will say, like, those those were all much better than my act. The Again, because the movie I actually watched after this was the film we're covering next week. Oh, yeah. 
Mally, you've had, for those, I mean, obviously no one's going to know what else we're doing until next week's episode drops, but Mally must have had a really rough day. <laughs> it was a bad day. Yeah. So that's a good segue into uh, our clue for next week. I'll go ahead and give it now. Uh, it is the first documentary that we're going to cover on the show. Uh, it's a very, it's going to be, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's going to be a very intense episode. So, uh, tune in next week to see what that's all about. But lastly Ooh. for the lighthouse is, you know, would you recommend this movie to someone who has not seen it? I'm going to go with yes and no. It really depends on the person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I I have a buddy of mine who literally, like, I mentioned that we were going to be covering this movie. He's like, oh, man, I really want to see it. And I was like, oh, you should not watch it. (laughs) I was like, you're going to hate this fucking movie. Because he, this is a, this is a gentleman who's very, uh, uh, what's the word? Fragile with his masculinity. Okay. Oh, so yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know if this is the one for you, bro. No. He's like, I had to think and have feelings, and it disturbed me. <laughs> yeah. What, it is, what about you, Utah? Do you think people should watch this movie? Uh, I'm it's I'm with Mally the same way. It's the same thing. It's the reason why I did not recommend this to 90 percent of my friends, but I recommend it to Mally because I was like, Mally, this shit's fucked up. You should check it out. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> But, uh, um, I mean, like, I said I was going to be on this episode, and I was talking to my other, like, really good friend, uh, Dan, who was my roommate in college and all through, like, when I lived in New Orleans, and he came, we got, came up in the industry together, he's one of my best friends, and he was like, oh, I need to watch that movie, and I was like, yeah, but, and I had to couch it, and I had to describe it, and I'm like, it's this, you know, Freudian nightmare to toxic male egos trapped in a phallic symbol slowly going insane together and it ends it's a major downer and it you know what i mean like i'm like i'm like so you have to be in the headspace for that shit you know um but like what i tell like is my fiance ever gonna see that movie hell no (laughs) i would never tell her to watch that movie you know none of my family members (laughs) yeah no um i would so i shouldn't have recommended this to my mother earlier (laughs) um you know, I'm just going to say... I Nana, I've got the movie for you. <laughs> I'm just going to say I don't. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Um, I, I This is one of those movies where I can appreciate it for what it is and recognize that it is a really well-made movie, but it is not something that I feel like I could say, yeah, I recommend this to anyone. Like, yes, you should watch this. Um, I think it's... For me, at least, it was an absolute chore to get through on this rewatch. And the little glimpses of greatness that we do get, such as the visuals, the acting, the directing, um, I just feel like it's not worth the investment of a two-hour runtime. Like I said, I think this would work so much better as a short, but that's just for me. Like I said, I I do recognize this as being a a good movie. Same with The Witch. I don't recommend the witch to people, but I do recognize it as a really well-made movie. Um, but having to it's pick, it's like you can I, recommend it as an experience in a way. Yeah, you know? maybe like maybe as, as like a one-time thing, but definitely not as like this is a movie I put my stamp of approval on, kind of thing. Well, it's 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 like you know, it's it's very art housey. You know, it's yeah. very like you need. To, <laughs> it needs to be a movie that like you're like you need to be in the dark, turn the volume up. So it permeates everything. Because I saw it in the dark theater that was empty. It was just Jason and I, basically. I think maybe one person. Yeah. And it was just like that horn comes in. And, and you know, being in the theater with it, and it just like you're you're stuck there with them. And it's, permeated. it's not like I can get up and walk in the kitchen and make a sandwich. You know, I was just yeah. like, oh, you know, and just letting it kind of like wash over you and know that there are things that are purposely kind of there to not make sense. Even though, like I said, as I took notes, the movie makes more sense to me now. Yeah than it did and like what certain things mean and things that I very clearly think are hallucinations and aren't and who I For think, sure. you know, all that stuff, you know? Um, but if you're a type of person who likes that kind of stuff, like really likes letting some experiencing something that's challenging and like mm-hmm. pulling things out of it, then I recommend it. But if yeah. you're a regular movie goer, fuck no. Yeah. It's definitely not for the common mainstream film audience. Uh, Robert Eggers is one of those directors that, again, I can recognize his brilliance and I can appreciate the work he does. He's just not for me. But I do think 
he will go down as like a very legendary uh, indie director. Maybe he'll have, I mean, The Lighthouse was a pretty big deal for not just A24, but for horror fans and art house fans in general. So, you know, I, I'll i definitely keep seeing his movies. Um, it's, it's interesting. He's one of those directors that even if I really don't like his past work, I'll keep watching what he does just to fully appreciate him as a filmmaker. Um, yeah. But that being I said. I mean, I will watch after The Witch and Lighthouse. I will watch any Robert Eggers movie. Sure. 100% like, agree. If I had to pick, though, I think I would rather rewatch The Witch than watch this. This is Like I said, this for me, this is a chore. Um, I'd rather but... you shut the fuck up, Dustin. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, let's get out of here. Thank you for listening, everyone. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe, rate, feedback, all that good stuff. Share us with your friends and your family. Um, like us on our various... <laughs> but not this movie. Yeah, not maybe this not movie. this episode. <laughs> or, yeah, not this movie. That's a better way of saying it. Uh, like us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and, of course, the subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. And uh, I've already given the clue for next week, but, yeah, it is a documentary. It is a heavy subject. Um, I think I'll probably even put a little tag up front on next week's episode that gives you a little warning about what we're going to be talking about, but... Yeah, if that piques your interest at all, please tune in. It is a it's a very important movie, I think. Anyways, that's just the way I see it. Mally will get into it next week with that one. But Utah, thank uh, you sure so much for rejoining us for the three peat talking about uh, yeah, this movie. You definitely brought a lot to my eyes that I didn't see. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna in, in I'm gonna film, pitch so. a I'm gonna pitch you a bonus feature on your podcast where I just Ooh. read you my eight pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Maybe we just put it to the foghorn sound, like the score from the movie. And oh just, yeah, like, have that going in the background of the waves <laughs> yeah, yeah. crashing. Yeah, <laughs> and you gotta you gotta read it in that Willem Dafoe accent and and like period accurate dialogue too. Why like. just spill your beans? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's the lighthouse. Honestly, scrap this entire episode. Just release that. <laughs> uh, that's the lighthouse from 2019. Uh, if you want more of our show, we've got a ton of back catalog episodes, and we're not even halfway through this season, so there's a lot more to come. Uh, tune in next week, uh, where we cover our first documentary on the show. Uh, it's a season of first for sure, so Ooh. you won't want to miss it. It's going to be a, a crazy episode. So. Tune in then, uh, and as always, Excelsior. Excelsior. <laughs> Excelsior. 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 Oh. Look at us.